Hello and welcome to a talk about life and death on the high seas, the remarkable lives of the storm petrels. Uh, I'm Rob Thomas. Now there are lots of different uh, species of storm petrels, about 28 species around the world, but the species of storm petrel that we have breeding on the West Wales islands of Skoma and Skokum is the European storm petrel, uh, surely one of the best birds in the world. Um, it's a very small seabird, it's the smallest seabird in the Atlantic Ocean, it weighs only about 25-26 grams, it's about the weight of two one pound coins. Uh, if you think about it, that's quite cheap for a seabird. Uh, it's a very highly oceanic species. It spends most of its life far out to sea. Uh, it comes on shore primarily uh, under the cover of darkness in order to breed. And it's a long distance migrant. Um, birds breeding um, on the West Wales Islands are known um, from bird ringing recoveries um, to spend the winter far to the south uh, in the fertile upwelling waters off South Africa and Namibia. And it's known that um, some birds from the Atlantic population, Northwest Atlantic breeding birds, uh, actually round the Cape into the Indian Ocean to spend their winter. Um, they're very good at surviving during these um, long distance migrations. They um, can survive quite commonly for 20 years or more. Um, the longest lived storm petrel so far is the bird that was uh, caught in Orkney um, and was re-caught 38 years later. Um, but because it was already an adult when it was first caught, um, it's very likely to have been over 40 years old on its re uh, subsequent recapture. Incredible survivors on the open ocean. As you can see, uh, the birds are small enough to fit quite snugly into the, the palm of a hand. Um, the hands in this photo is a particularly large hand, uh, the hand of Big Dave Kelly of Trinity College Dublin, um, one of my largest friends. And uh, we study from Cardiff University the lives of the storm petrels um, on migration past the coasts of Portugal. Um, each summer we have study um, involvement on Shetland and the Faroe Islands and it's been a great pleasure over the years um, to link with Rich and Giselle and others on Skokum Island especially uh, in their studies of the storm petrels breeding there. And the birds are mysterious partly because they're highly nocturnal at least on land um, and that's one of their strategies to avoid uh, their predators. of which they have many. Um, the European storm petrels um, breed quite widely around the coasts of Northwest Europe and um, the Atlantic breeding population uh, is considered generally to be a subspecies, uh, numbers about half a million pairs. So it's not a very rare bird, um, but it's uh, far less common than human beings, for example, in the, in the same area. Um, there is a, a smaller population breeding in the Mediterranean uh, basin, about 14,000 pairs. And uh, these two populations diverged uh, about 400,000 years ago, associated with changes in sea level uh, through the glaciations. So, um, as you can see, the, uh, there are a lot of storm petrels breeding in Iceland, Faroe Islands, uh, Britain and Ireland. Uh, for many years, you've, this uh, species was known as the British storm petrel, but as you can see, the, the British breeding population is nowhere near as big as the Faroese breeding population. The circles here um, scale to reflect the, the different population size of the different uh, nations. And uh, one of our uh, friends and collaborators on, on the Faroe Islands, 
uh, the legendary storm petrol researcher uh, Jens Schelt Jensen um, points out that uh, the species would be better called the Faroese storm petrel than the, the British storm petrel, but we all tend to call it the European storm petrel these days. But the um, as I say, uh, are one of about 28 species of storm petrels around the world. But curiously, the exact number of storm petrels is, is, uh, keeps changing, um, partly because at least one storm petrel um, has gone extinct in historic times. That's the Guadeloupe storm petrel, which um, from Guadeloupe Island off uh, the coast of Baja California it was last seen in 1912, uh, very likely now to, to be extinct. Um, the, there are other storm petrels, uh, that, um, including the New Zealand storm petrel, which was last seen in 1827 and then was assumed to have become extinct until it was rediscovered at sea um, in 2003 and seems to have been a recovery associated with the clearance of rats from Little Barrier Island uh, in the Hairiki Gulf in New Zealand, uh, which is the only known um, modern breeding location of the species. Then um, the New Caledonian storm petrel was uh, very recently described in 2022, uh, closely related species to the New Zealand storm petrel. You see their streaky tummies, part of the street storm petrel species complex group of species. Um, similarly, the Pinkoya storm petrel, uh, not a, so much a storm petrel to the open ocean, but of the enclosed fjords in Chile, uh, described in 2009. Uh, Montero storm petrel, the, the fork-tailed uh, version of Bandrump storm petrel breeding on Prior Islet in the Azores. Um, discovered or described first in 2004. So um, of these 24 different species, they're divided into the northern storm petrels, uh, of which there are 18 species in total. You, we see the first 12. Some of these are, are very mysterious species. This one, uh, top right, the Matsudera storm petrel of Japan, may currently breed um, on only one island. Uh, its global range restricted to one island, making it very, very vulnerable to the arrival of invasive species like rats, which storm petrels really don't get on well with. Uh, the northern storm petrels include uh, the now extinct Guadeloupe storm petrel, top right here, um, the least storm petrel, um, Turns out not to be the least of the storm petrels. Um, it's not uh, the smallest species in the world. Uh, that turns out to be almost certainly uh, this little species here, the white vented storm petrel of um, the Galapagos and South America, uh, which weighs as little as 17 grams. Absolutely astonishing for a seagoing sea seabird. Uh, out on the open ocean in all conditions. Um, incredible survivors despite their, their tiny, tiny body size. So the northern uh, storm petrels and the southern storm petrels, historically they've been regarded as part of the, the same family of birds. But more recently, genetic studies suggest that they are actually two quite separate families and the um, the southern storm petrels may be more closely related to the albatrosses than they are to the northern storm petrels. The, the relationships are still being uh, analysed and, um, and uh, investigated in more detail but it seems that the northern and southern storm petrels have converged on this small black and white water walking type phenotype um, body plan and, and behaviour, uh, despite being from, from rather different families of, of uh, tubinose seabirds. So um, 
the European Storm Petrel here, together with Wilson's Storm Petrel from the, the Southern uh, Storm Petrel family. Um, and the Storm Petrels, of course, are a part of the wider group of birds, including the Petrels, is a Cape Petrel, and the Albatrosses. Um, so they're uh, the smallest members of the tube-nosed seabird family. Very highly adapted to uh, life on the open ocean. For example, they can drink seawater. Uh, they don't uh, necessarily have access to, to fresh water to drink at all. Um, and they can filter out the salt from uh, the seawater that they drink, partly using their, their kidneys, partly using salt glands above the eye in the head. And um, salt water um, is concentrated into a very strong salt solution, which is trickled out then through the bird's nostrils. And a uh, very efficient uh, salt water filtration system, which allows the birds to survive. without access to, um, to fresh water at all. In terms of the breeding behaviour, um, again, storm petrels are just remarkable little birds. Um, they, they have one of the largest egg sizes of, of any bird. The egg is about 20 to 30% of the adult body mass, which is remarkable really, given that they're very aerodynamic, swallow-like birds uh, in their uh, body design and flight patterns, so carrying an egg up to 30% of the, the female's body mass before laying uh, is quite a remarkable feat in itself. Uh, the picture in the top right here shows the, the brood patch, uh, the patch of defeathered skin that the bird uses to uh, warm the egg uh, until it hatches. And the chick breaks out of the egg, uh, like many other bird species, the chick breaks through the egg uh, shell using its egg tooth, uh, little um, calcified lump on the end of the bill, uh, which drops off as the, as the chick uh, starts, to, starts to grow. So it's a, a single egg that they lay, a large white egg that almost seems to glow in the, in the half light of the burrow. Uh, this bird is uh, one of Ben Porter's study birds on the Faroe Islands. This is in an artificial nest box. The chick, um, of course, when it emerges, it's egg-sized. And um, as its feathers dry out, they fluff out into this powder puff. Very, very cute chick when it's uh, young. It starts off... For the European storm petrel, at least about five or six grams, and enters this very rapid um, uh, growth phase, quite linear, straight line uh, increase in rapid um, gain in body mass over the first 25 days or so of its life. And bearing in mind that most songbirds of this sort of size would fledge the nest in 14 days, European storm petrels and other storm petrels are very long. Um, uh, chick development periods, uh, this one lasting 60 to 70 days in the European storm petrel. So the first phase of growth is very rapid, almost linear. Uh, the second phase then is a sort of plateauing, a leveling out of body mass. And uh, the third phase, the final phase before fledging, is uh, a decline in body mass as the parents start to uh, give up on feeding the chick. Um, but if we superimpose the adult body mass on this growth trajectory, we see something quite remarkable, really, which is that um, the adult body mass, 25, 26 grams, is greatly exceeded by the, the chick. And some of these chicks are uh, almost uh, reaching double the adult body mass uh, before they eventually decline um, to a more aerodynamic body weight uh, prior to fledging. Um, Here's one of Ben's uh, storm petrel chicks um, being weighed. The, the cupcake arrangement here is um, to minimise transmission um, body contact between different individual chicks from different nests, just to minimise the chances of transmission of, of avian influenza uh, more recently.
Now, um, currently, uh, all sorts of new technologies are being brought to bear on the study of storm petrels, which have remained very hard to study. Um, they're quite sensitive to disturbance. Uh, they only come on shore under the cover of darkness. They breed in underground burrows and very hard to access. So various um, bits of technology now are being uh, used to study the lives of these quite mysterious seabirds. Um, here's Bardsey Ben Porter. Um, Bardsey Ben is about to start his PhD at Cardiff um, on uh, the storm petrels of the Faroe Islands. Uh, Ben's already been involved in the Faroe's work um, for several years and uh, also in our work on storm petrels out in the Azores. And part of Ben's work is very much involved in tracking these tiny seabirds using these tiny little GPS loggers uh, that are attached to the central tail feathers of the bird. You might just be able to see the antenna of a GPS logger attached to the tail of this um, band-rumped storm petrel on the Azores. And this technology now has just become miniaturised enough to um, fit on even European storm petrels, um, on the, the, the smallest of the Atlantic seabirds. And this is really revealing uh, for the first time, um, the at-sea adventures of these uh, birds that are so hard to study otherwise. And uh, here is Ben's first track. This is the first ever track of a European storm petrel from the Faroe Islands. And we see the bird going out to um, this um, start sharp drop-off uh, in the marine topography. Um, between the Faroe Islands and the Shetland Islands. And um, incredibly exciting science, you know, finding out for the first time really what these birds uh, do at sea. Uh, here's Ben downloading one of these tracks uh, accompanied by Zoe Deakin and Mark Bolton of the RSPB. Uh, Mark is I think his title is Head of Seabirds, uh, which sounds like he tells puffins what to do, but um, he's, a, he's a real storm petrel uh, enthusiast and, and uh, uh, leading on the, on the tracking work. Um, the tracks themselves uh, reveal a lot of details about the birds' lives. Um, we can divide the tracks up into um, commuting behaviour, um, basically flying quickly in a straight line. Um, and the more tortuous parts of the tracks, coded in blue and red here, indicates foraging type behaviour. And we can look at uh, the time of day or night at which those behaviours take place. So the, the bold dots are at night, the paler dots are during the day. This is a two day journey out from the Faroe Islands. And you can see that uh, some of these foraging activities are taking place at night um, as well as some during the day as well. So that there certainly appear to be nocturnally foraging during the breeding season. And then returning back, this is a, a circular clockwise trip, uh, returning back um, during darkness, arriving back at the burrow under the cover of darkness to avoid problems uh, posed by predators. So lots of very exciting science coming from these GPS tracking studies, which have only really be, become possible as the technology has become miniaturised enough uh, over the last few years. Um, more technology involves spying inside the nest. Um, Hannah Harrowood here, as always Hannah, um, has um, developed the use of uh, little Raspberry Pi circuit boards fitted with cameras and um, Hannah's uh, Raspberry Pi cameras are being widely used to uh, investigate the behaviour and ecology of storm petrels in their breeding burrows. So revealing behaviours for the first time um, by filming birds without them being disturbed. And so um, we're, we're seeing mating behaviour um, being filmed for the first time. The um, 
mutual head grooming behavior of parent birds as they meet each other in their burrows, uh, all sorts of wonderful behaviors being revealed by this miniaturized technology. Hannah now uh, is working for uh, BTO Cymru and uh, uh, is uh, um, still very involved in, in uh, the storm petrel research. Closer to home, um, the uh, storm petrels on Skokum, of course, have deluxe accommodation these days. Um, petrol Station 1 um, is increasingly, year by year, occupied by breeding pairs of storm petrels. And um, I just love this. It's a work of art, isn't it? The uh, nest boxes, the banks of nest boxes, um, faced with the beautiful uh, herringbone-style dry, dry stone walling. Uh, typical of the, the Pembrokeshire Islands, just a, a wonderful installation and being used by the birds in their um, dry, secure breeding sites. And the, the birds breeding in the Skokum Petrol Station, uh, being studied using video technology by Chris Payne and colleagues, uh, in collaboration with Rich and Giselle as the warden team. And again, it's just incredible footage coming from this work. Um, here is uh, one of Chris's films of a recently hatched chick being attended by its parents. And you can see the, the parent is regurgitating sort of semi-digested fish stew, you could call it, um, directly into the, the mouth of the, the tiny chick here. Uh, the camera is pointing towards the, the exit to the burrow. Now and again, you see the Irish Sea Ferry uh, passing by outside. But uh, the birds are, are safe and secure in their, um, in their accommodation here. And uh, this is Chamber 64, it's a um, successful um, breeding site. And uh, great to see this footage coming through and uh, Chris and team providing uh, amazing uh, revelations into the into the world of uh, the storm petrels and their breeding behavior lots of great discoveries coming from that you can see uh, here is the growing chick basically comes a huge tub of lard uh, again sometimes double the parent's own body weight and uh, providing lots and lots of high energy um, fish and uh, semi-digested invertebrates as well um, to enable that rapid body growth. Another kind of technology that um, is being used to study storm petrels involves food and foraging. And um, storm petrels are largely scavengers at the, um, at the sea surface. Um, this lovely painting by Cat Poose Jones shows a, a storm petrel just pattering over the water's surface. And um, they, they um, fly slowly over the sea surface, tracking the ups and downs of the waves and picking up bits of um, floating food that they find, uh, picking up almost whatever they find, including, unfortunately, sometimes these days, bits of floating plastic that they mistake for food. They can also dive under the water. Here we see 
some storm petrels circling around a food source and this one is just diving and under the surface uh, the next um, picture here shows it having a little swim around picking up uh, bits of uh, dead fish in this instance the pattering um, exposes them to um, damage to their legs and feet by fish striking them from below seemingly and about five percent of adult storm petrels are carrying these um, you know, fairly substantial uh, injuries, um, losing toes, sometimes losing the whole foot or the whole leg. Um, one of the commonest disabilities in any wild bird, but the, the birds, again, are incredible survivors. They can survive these injuries, go on and breed perfectly su successfully with just one leg. The feeding behaviour um, has been very difficult to study in terms of what the birds actually eat. And these two very dear colleagues, um, Renata Medeiros, uh, who was one of our PhD students, uh, now a lecturer at Cardiff University. Uh, Bill Simonson passed away last year and a um, very, very valued colleague who is, who is much, li much, li much missed. And Bill pioneered the use of DNA technology to investigate animal diets. And Renata in her PhD applied that to the diet of storm petrels. And um, this is a method that involves identifying storm petrels' prey from um, the faeces, or sometimes the, the regurgitated prey, um, obtained from the birds by isolating the DNA of the prey from the storm petrel faeces and then amplifying that DNA, scaling it up, replicating it, and identifying the sequences of base pairs, amino acid base pairs, um, on the DNA strands and that allows us to compare those DNA sequences with the sequences of known species of prey um, on online databases and this gives us species level descriptions of the diet of storm petrels so again great revelations of what do these birds actually eat and how do they obtain that food at sea So here are some of the results from Renata's PhD. Uh, different species of storm petrel prey revealed by this method of DNA analysis of DNA extracted from the bird's faeces. And um, this is a, a slide uh, representing the diet of storm petrels as they pass Portugal and they eat a lot of sardines uh, as do I when I'm passing Portugal. Uh, it's a big part of the storm petrels diet, uh, about 40%, 48% of the, the prey sequences uh, came from, 48% 40, of, of uh, samples rather, contains sardine DNA. Other species include these uh, small pelagic um, commercial fish, Atlantic mackerel, horse mackerel, and um, some of the species were quite a surprise. So um, the prey included um, some deep water species like this greater fork beard. Um, storm petrels feed al almost entirely in you know, the sea surface or the first few centimetres below the sea surface. Um, whereas these deep water species, probably they're accessing them as fishery discards, um, as, as offal or, or, or dead fish that um, fall from the nets as they're brought up from the depths. And storm petrels, both in Portugal and, and further north around the breeding colonies, they do appear to be exploiting fishery discards. Um, other surprises included terrestrial invertebrates, um, like butterflies. Uh, they're probably getting these um, from migrating butterflies, migrating across the sea. And sometimes the butterflies get stuck to the sea surface. Uh, or even might be taken in flight. We, we don't really know much about the route uh, for foraging on uh, butterflies and, and other terrestrial invertebrates. We also had a storm petrel that had eaten a dolphin, uh, not necessarily a whole dolphin. Um, the fact that prey DNA gets into storm petrel diets um, could be via a variety of routes. They could be scavenging on the flesh of a dead dolphin uh, or eating 
uh, dolphin feces or placenta. Um, there's a range of possible roots there. And we also found that storm petrels eat a lot of these isopods. These are just a few millimetres long. Um, incredible, really. Uh, they, they appear to be uh, eating them at night. Um, they're not bioluminescent creatures at all, so how they're finding them in the dark is, is still a mystery. Uh, but these isopods of different species have different behaviour and ecology, and that reveals aspects of the storm petrel's foraging strategy as well. So, for example, some of these um, species migrate to the sea surface at night, um, and that's evidence then, if the storm petrels are feeding on those species, of nocturnal um, um, feeding by the storm petrels uh, out at sea. Others of these um, isopod species emerge into the surf zone, so they're, they're basically beach dwelling species that come out into the surf zone at high tide uh, and that's evidence for nocturnal inshore even intertidal foraging by the storm petrels along Portuguese beaches at night which uh, again is a, a new discovery. There's lots of variation in diet between years that seems to be driven by uh, climate change and as I mentioned there seems to be a lot of exploitation of fishery discards and as fishery regulations change, that is likely to influence the availability of discards to storm petrels uh, foraging at sea. Now, storm petrels um, are vulnerable to all sorts of threats, and that raises a lot of conservation issues. If we look across the um, the 28 or so uh, species of storm petrels, we can see that um, the number of species declining is quite substantial. So about 14 of the species of the 28 species are considered to be uh, decreasing. Six are considered to be stable and only one is considered to be um, definitely increasing. Um, for other species, their population trends remain unknown. And there are lots of threats, um, not least a very important threat is invasive species, non-native species arriving on the breeding islands um, and where the storm petrels are very vulnerable uh, to interference and especially predation by these non-native species. Rats and cats are the, the, the classic uh, invasive predators of storm petrels, causing huge problems around the world. Uh, here's the sign that greets you when you arrive on Nolsoy Island in the Faroes, um, location of uh, the largest um, colony in the world of the European storm petrel. This is just one part of the, uh, the vast colony on Nolsoy Island. Uh, but Nolsoy has a population of about 200 people, a regular ferry service, very, very vulnerable to the arrival of rats. And so um, a lot of biosecurity concern around um, uh, keeping rats off Nolsoy and other islands in the Faroes where storm petrels breed. Likewise for Skoma and Skokum, they're so valuable as seabird breeding colonies because of the absence of terrestrial mammalian predators and of course there's huge efforts going into maintaining uh, them as, um, as uh, predator-free islands um, by excluding rats and other invasives. Of course there are invasive species, non-native species breeding. On Skoma there's little owls uh, which take their, um, their own toll on storm petrels. Um, little owls used to breed on, on uh, Skokum as well with a much bigger population of storm petrels. Um, Ronald Lockley found a, a, um, a little owl nest in, in his day containing multiple headless corpses of, of storm petrels and of course uh, he uh, had the strategy of removing uh, little owls from, from Skokum as they arrived. And other islands, non-native species in the Azores include the Madeiran um, war lizard which uh, appears to eat both eggs and chicks of the endemic Monteros uh, storm petrel there, one of the, the rarest seabirds in the world. Um, other threats include the risks from avian influenza. There haven't yet been any definite cases of 
avian influenza in, in storm petrels. Um, but that's certainly a, a distinct possibility and a huge risk given uh, the prevalence of avian influenza on seabird islands. Um, other threats include light pollution, both on land but also at sea, uh, including the burn-off flares from uh, oil and gas installations. Very little is known about the risks to storm petrels at sea, which may be attracted at night to these flares and uh, deadly flares if they enter the flame, of course. Uh, ben Porter's PhD is um, going to include an assessment of these risks by tracking the birds and seeing uh, how frequently they enter the um, light attraction zone of these installations at sea and their in interactions with other marine installations like fish farms as well. And then there is, of course, the climate threat. Storm petrels are very vulnerable to being storm driven. And um, this uh, little inset here shows a, a leech's storm petrel that was picked up uh, dead on a Portuguese beach after a, a winter storm. And um, the increasing prevalence of uh, hurricanes and uh, strong storms uh, poses a threat to, to storm petrels throughout their annual cycle. So there's lots to be concerned about, but lots of good conservation action um, to implement. And we, we increasingly know how to, um, how to conserve storm petrels to do our best for them. These incredibly wonderful tiny survivors of the open ocean and uh, I hope um, that we can do everything we can uh, to protect and conserve their, their population. It's including of course on SCOMA and SCOCOM. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to, um, to work with uh, Rich and Giselle and their teams over the years uh, in getting to know the storm petrels of, of Skokum and, and to understand some aspects of their amazing lives. So thank you for listening uh, to this talk.